Hello, folks. Welcome back to the Podcast Digest. This is Dan Lizette. Thank you all very much for joining me again. This episode of the Podcast Digest is brought to you by listeners like you via our Patreon campaign and also by Podbean. Podbean podcast hosting and monetization. It's the easiest way to start podcasting. Check out podbean.com backslash TPD to learn more and get one month free. I'll tell you more about Podbean in a little while. But on to episode 111. This is a great one, folks. Really Really happy to talk to my guest this week. My guest was Julie Shapiro from Radiotopia. She is the executive producer at Radiotopia, but also the co-founder of the Third Coast International Audio Festival. And we had a great conversation about all things audio from her time uh, over in Australia to her involvement with Third Coast to Radiotopia and some behind the scenes story about how day-to-day works at Radiotopia. And we covered uh, a few questions about advertising as well in this uh, ever-evolving world of podcasting. It was a really great conversation. It was my honor to have Julie Shapiro on the show. She is a great conversationalist, and I really enjoyed our uh, chat, and I think that you will too. And if you do, take a minute, guys. Leave a review on iTunes. Tell a friend about the show. Share it on social media. All that fun stuff. You know, the stuff that helps little independent shows like mine uh, find a bigger, broader audience. Greatly appreciate it. So without further delay, folks, I don't want to delay this any more than necessary. Let's get right to my conversation with Julie Shapiro. Folks, as I mentioned up front, very excited to be joined by my guest this week. She is the executive producer from Radiotopia, Julie Shapiro. Welcome to the Podcast Digest. Thank you. It's really fun to be here. It's great to have you. There's so many interesting things in uh, preparing for a conversation that I, that I look forward to talking to you about. But before we jump into Radiotopia, Third Coast, and all the wonderful things that you've been a part of, I want to kind of go back and let folks get to know you a little bit pre-audio days. So way back to the youth, so to speak. Tell folks a little bit about yourself. Oh, okay. Um, well, I grew up in Northeast Ohio, so uh, Midwestern, born and raised. And most of my childhood was consumed with an obsession with horses. I was a really serious rider in my mind, <laughs> at <laughs> least. Um, grew up in a rural setting, so it was easy enough to, to do that. Um, and yeah, I was uh, kind of got into listening to a lot of music, which eventually took me uh, through college, degree in sociology in from the University of uh, Colorado at Boulder, and um, then en- ended up in Portland, Oregon, where my record store employee career continued, <laughs> started in Boulder, actually started in Kentucky before that. Um, so I guess the through line would be horses, music. <laughs> books, lots of reading, um, really read a ton growing up. And then that kind of all morphed into eventually working with the Center for Documentary Studies, getting into radio, was not like a public radio listener in our household, um, although my my parents are now. And the, the kind of way I found myself in the creative audio storytelling world was through, yeah, through music and then through increasingly experimental music, and story and driving around the country a lot, (laughs) trying to decide what to do with my life and listening to a lot of radio. So listening really became something that was very constant for me before I was actually doing what I do. Um, But yeah, I feel like I got to the doorstep of what I do now through through music and books. Uh, And, you know, I think I found myself as a person and had a sense of responsibility in the world. And followed like was very motivated to do the horse thing growing up so all of those are the ingredients to that got me to where i am as a as a quick aside julie there i've learned um through people reaching out to me and then digging around a little bit there is a huge amount and a huge listener base apparently for horse-based podcasts (laughs) it is a (laughs) huge industry like one of the um one of the biggest shows i guess they have a daily show on you know riding horses and taking care of them and so on and so forth it was was really interesting when i started looking at that but just as an aside (laughs) yeah but there's not a great storytelling podcast out there and therein you have hit upon my secret burning desire to bring like 
you know, the top tier storytelling podcast relating to horses and people. An untapped market. To the I'm people. Sure. I think so. I think so. Plenty of sponsorship opportunities out there, I'm sure. Well, we're, we're gonna, and a built-in we're, lady, and a built in audience. Yeah, that's for sure. We're, we're going to talk about Radiotopia at, at, at length here in just a moment. But I and we, I wanted to ask you about show edition. So, so maybe show number 16 <laughs> could be a storytelling horse show. <laughs> oh, you mean po- you mean PonyCast? There you go, PonyCast. Yeah. That sounds yeah. great. <laughs> yeah, I can't really abuse my my uh, position of of uh, some of authority in this case to do that. But uh, if anyone out there listening has a great idea for a horse cast, I'm just saying we haven't heard it yet. There we go. Uh, definitely an untapped market. Um, so you said you mentioned in college it was uh, sociology that you went to school for originally. Yeah, I have a sociology major um, and a, a minor in feminist studies. So how did the arc from there to your first uh, dipping of the toe into some of the, the audio uh, storytelling production happen? I think the um, the step in between was actually I did a zine for a long time, and I really felt like what I was studying in sociology played out in the zine, which was kind of all over the um, sort of varied in topic it wasn't a theme based scene but it was it was sort of all interests some had to do with uh reviewing music and books and some were just essays and writings of my own observations about the world and people in the world which was where the sociology came in and i also had a, a participatory component to that where people sent in um entries or submissions and they would go back out in the zine so i feel like some of the audio things i got interested in related in some ways to the zine i'd been making all those years in college and after college as well um and in fact my, at my first internship at wnc i had a, a news director who found my like dug around in my resume and the, the folder i sent it in and pulled out my zine and you know wanted to pursue the idea of how do you put a zine on the radio um and this was early uh i guess when was it it was mid 90s so it was right when this american life was heating up. And there was a sense that you could get very creative and tell personal stories on the radio through audio. And that that was kind of when I was stepping into the field a bit. Wonderful. And and what did that journey start out for you? What was, um, you mentioned internship, was that the the, the first official position? Yeah, my, the first thing I did was stop by uh, WKSU in Kent, Ohio to volunteer for a pledge drive. Um, A friend's stepfather's good friend was the development director there. Um, and that's actually when I first met uh, Eric Newsom. He was in in Kent, who's now at Audible and was at NPR for so long. So it's funny. He was actually one of the first people I met in radio. Um, and then I that experience led me to think I wanted to definitely pursue public radio, but I didn't want to stay in Northeast Ohio. So I started sending uh, a resume out to different stations. And at that point, like Chapel Hill sort of loomed large in the imagination of public radio, even though it was kind of a small town. And so it was a place that I knew there was a great music scene. <laughs> that was about as much as I knew about Chapel Hill. So I could go to Chapel Hill and probably probably be happy there, you know, to my in my brain back then. It made sense. And that was where um, there was this news director who kind of took a chance on someone with no media or broadcast training but saw something in the ideas that had, you know, had motivated me leading up to deciding I wanted to be in radio. So the next stop was Chapel Hill. Yeah, Chapel Hill. And what was your sort of day-to-day role there? Well, I didn't last very long as a news intern because um, they all of a sudden a job opened up. So I was interning and working at like the Cat's Cradle, the Great Rock Club in Chapel Hill. And uh, then a job opened up that was purely administrative. So I switched over to being like an assistant to the program director at the station. And then I got kind of bored and left and went on the road with a band selling t-shirts and went to New Zealand for three months. And when I got (laughs) sort of wandered away from radio, when I got back into the States, I, um, by chance through WUNC connections was given this opportunity to produce a call and talk show about Southeastern literature. So I took that job. Um, this man, Paul Zalis totally gave me, uh, he was like an angel, gave me the the chance, you know, without knowing much about me and pretty much said, you know, just don't fuck it up. And <laughs> here, here it is. And uh, so I, I went through that while I was working at the Center for Documentary Studies, which I'd also become very interested in, which is in Durham. So I was uh, working in the evenings there and then producing this radio show during the daytimes at w, through WNC. So I was kind of hanging on to the radio at that point, but also getting this documentary background a little bit more under my belt. Um and then did that for a few years and then ended up in Chicago, uh, drawn there sort of by some of the cultural 
um, this was sort of the, the, the cultural heavyweights for me back then were like the Baffler Journal and Drag City, this music label, and WBEZ, This American Life, and that kind of trio of my interests pulled myself and my boyfriend at the time up to Chicago right when Third Coast was starting. It was a really happy accident of timing and being in the right place at the right time and knowing a few connectors between Third Coast and This American Life and what I was doing at the Center for Documentary Studies. Now, a lot of people listening to this show, Julie, have probably heard the term Third Coast, right? But mm. they may not know too much about it. I sort of had to piece together a little bit of it now after talking to a, a lot of people who've I've talked to a few people who've attended a few people who've been influenced by, by things that have come out of there I think I got a okay grasp but for anybody who doesn't know I know you were involved for a very long time tell us about the Third Coast uh, International Audio Festival sure I was a co-founder with Johanna Zorn back in 2000 and that was right when this renaissance of creative audio was starting to really uh, peak its head up and the documentary form was being recognized more as an art form. And Third Coast was really um, about supporting independent work and producers making creative long form audio, although it became medium and short form as well over the years. But it started out as a competition to celebrate the best work out there, a conference so the community could gather. Independent producers were sort of, you know, the, the sort of stereotype is working by yourself in your closet. So we wanted to create a space where people could come together and share their skills learn from each other, have some fun, strengthen the network of, of producers, uh, eventually internationally, not just in North America. And we had a radio show, we did public audio challenges and started um, doing public listening events, our listening rooms. And so it just became this huge kind of vessel for celebrating the forum and encouraging people to push boundaries and develop their skills and do that all as a community. And it seems to be, like you said, massive nowadays. I, I hear about it mentioned and in and, and terms of people participating or attending all the time. How has it grown over all these years? Yeah, we started, um, you know, I think the first year we probably had about 250 people at the conference. And it was a project of WBEZ at the time. And then about eight years in, we went independent, um, not by choice, but in a way that it worked out pretty well. Johanna um, and I worked really hard to create a um we became a 501c3 ourselves and uh, started a board and just stayed at WBEZ so we didn't have this huge disruption in how the festival was running. But it's really always been a very small, small but mighty um, organization. But yeah, it just grew because what around us was happening was the field was growing and, you know, sort of exploding and more people were coming into radio and not having to go through. Some were going through programs and learning audio production before they came into this field. Others were kind of jumping ship from other fields and coming into audio shows like this American life and then radio lab really got, you know, sparked people's imagination about what you could do with the form. And then there were other places you could learn like transom and salt and the center for documentary studies started these programs. So it really, you know, it grew on its own. Like we were, we were feeding, we were bringing, we were providing a platform for people to come together and feed each other in a way. And inviting all of the luminaries and the emerging producers and spreading the word internationally. So it really became the place to come every year. And it was a totally a very fun sort of place to, to uh, validate this field that people were getting into, find the top talent, find job opportunities, you know, the famous dance floor, uh, couples meeting on the dance floor. We can claim a couple high profile radio romances started at third coast I and mean, there are probably many we don't know about as well and you know positive networking i would say um yeah, but really that, that 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 sense of just putting people in a space and and then it was just such an incredible community and population that together you know they kind of would levitate the room every year Re really exceptionally exciting and warm and welcoming sort of conference setting that that people started telling us this is the one conference I don't skip any sessions at, you know, and so we always took that as the highest compliment, really. That is wonderful. And and, and w one of the uh, components of Third Coast, of course, is the competitions. And I've asked, I've told people that it's, it's sort of like the Sundance of audio, if you will. Yeah, we talked about that a lot. That was a, a shortcut way to explain a lot about what, what drove us and what we were about. Um, and the competition was really important because, A, it acknowledged um, – the, product, the best productions in the world. It paid cash money to the producers. It still does. And we would also put the winners on the radio on a national broadcast. So that was really a different thing than any other uh, awards out there for radio work. So 
Ira Glass hosted the first year, and then subsequently Gwen Maxi, who was uh, hosting the the Third Coast Weekly Show in Chicago, Resound, started hosting. And so it's been going strong since then, and it gives listeners all over the world a taste of the, all of the winning pieces. It's really it's a, it's a really fun broadcast. It comes out around Thanksgiving, so it's it's great kind of like gather around the you know gather in the car and on the way to relatives' house or while you're cooking, and it's become a tradition unto itself to listen to the broadcast. I, you know, and I know that the group and, and you guys have done so much to support uh, independent producers. And, and, you know, what's funny is that anyone, longtime listener of the Podcast Digest, you may remember way back when I had a guest. And what's funny is I just popped open the, the homepage for thirdcoastfestival.org. Link will be in the show notes, folks. And right here in the listen section, right in the middle, is one of my previous guests, Sophie Harper from Not By Accident. Uh, oh, that's great. Right here up front. And I remember I reached out to her. Her and I actually started talking before her first episode uh she said something on twitter and her and i had been going back and forth for a very long time and i I had her as a guest i think after two episodes in and she and i had a long conversation about it you know exposure and growing an audience and so on and so forth so to look at a website like this for third coast and to see her episode one smack dab in the middle just warms my heart because i know (laughs) she's done such amazing thing and, and still going it's great yeah, the dots start connecting. I mean, it's it's like a sort of vast, small world in in terms of the the creative public radio world, and now with the podcasting culture really changing things up a bit. Um, you know, it's been an, it's interesting now that I'm not with Third Coast anymore because I moved on in 2014, right when podcasting exploded, to like really root from the sidelines and see them engage as much with what's going on in podcasting and kind of adding that to the the mission and what drives Third Coast now has a lot to do with what else is going on around that um, radio world. You mentioned your departure from Third Coast, and I know not long after that, we're going to come to you joining Radiotopia. But uh, was that one to another or was there, there was, I know there was Australian Broadcasting Company in there as well. Yeah, I um the decision to leave was like a difficult but ultimately good one for me just to make to move on. It had been almost 14 years doing what I was doing with Johanna and you know, we parted on the best of terms and I could then become like publicly the number one third coast fan that I always was anyway from the inside, <laughs> but felt funny talking about it in certain ways. Um and what happened was the Australian Broadcasting Corporation had internally decided to form a new unit called the Creative Audio Unit. And so I went over to Sydney for, it ended up being just 19 months, but with another very small staff, a situation I was used to by then, um, formed this unit that uh, produced two weekly national shows that went out um, on RN, which was the NPR-like network of the ABC. So we had a sound art show and we had a sort of story-driven narrative show, one called Soundproof and one called Radiotonic. And for about a year and a half, that was like this incredible opportunity, very challenging as well. But we had a lot of money to pay to commission work from artists all over the world, producers uh, in Australia and beyond. And we trucked along. We did our best job with it. It was really gratifying. I learned a lot by doing that. Um, it was incredible to live in another country for a little while. I moved there with my husband and son, who was two and a half at the time. And uh, Australian ABC has always had a, a reputation of supporting and championing, you know, very sound rich, um, radiophonic work. And so it was really a privilege to go and work there with some of the best engineers in the world and give it, give that all a go for, for a little while. And you wrote a piece, uh, Julie, on Transom about uh, some of the time you spent there. And it was really interesting because I don't know that I'd been exposed to a lot of it. And I'm not sure many people listening had. And that was on the the sound, the more of the sound art side than the storytelling show that you were producing, right? And it was really interesting about you sort of talking about what all went into each episode and you sort of counterbalancing that with some of the feedback that you'd received. Was there any difficulty in sort of having all that work sort of have that type of reception at least in part um yeah that i know that i'm um the piece you're referring to late i think it was says something like haters of radio art take note or i can't remember the exact title but right. um yeah you know that show that show was an amazing experience because we were we knew we were making work that a very small number of people would appreciate or we were commissioning work from people who were making that work. and um, But we were so proud to provide a space for art on the airwaves, which, you know, there's almost no space for that anymore, even less than two years ago, I fear. 
Um, so I think we were proud of the work we did. We understood there would be some negative reception. I was very interested in kind of going deeper into why people felt so strongly against this material. Um, so getting beyond the liked it or didn't like it, like, what, you know, what, what was provoking people to respond sometimes violently to this work. So yeah. that was an interesting direction to take. And, you know, in the big scheme of things, that is part of what I love about what I do. Um, I'm obviously more involved with much more narrative driven work now. And even at Third Coast, where we could dip into sound art, there wasn't anything that extremely experimental that we did. So that was a really, a really happy experience to get to play in that space for a little while. Well, I found it super interesting. There was all kinds of uh, links and samples and actual episodes um, from that show from the time you were there. And it was definitely something unique. And uh, it was interesting to hear your take uh, from the side of the story that you were on there, as well as I said, that that feedback was uh, that one you were mentioning, like the violent. I'm like, wow, really? Uh, (laughs) Turn the station, buddy. Jeez. (laughs) Yeah, well, people get upset about all sorts of things. In the context, I think I say in the article, but there were a lot of changes going on at the ABC, which, uh, you know, the the, uh, the ruling government at the time was pretty anti-ABC, and a lot of listeners were just more conservative. So they were hearing this in the context of deciding they already hated the network or hated the institution, right. and so it was just fodder for, for you know, kind of small-minded, quick, impulsive response online, which happens all too often. But Yeah, YouTube, uh, <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah. So uh, the Radiotopia chapter, is that what brought you back stateside? It was, yeah. I was um, cheering my colleagues and friends, everyone involved with the beginning of Radiotopia, Roman and PRX, and all of the founding shows were, were all like, close colleagues through their coast through all of that time. And so I was really excited when it launched and um, Roman had actually called up to see if they could call it Radiotopia because I had sort of spontaneously created the notion of Radiotopia at a conference one year. Um, so I felt, I've already felt kind of connected. And then I heard about the grant. The Knight Foundation gave Radiotopia a million dollar grant. And that was very exciting because they were going to be able to hire an EP, which they clearly needed because everything was going gangbusters. Um, and I remember thinking, who should I nudge? Who should I like, you know, recommend for the job? sort of as an insider who I could help, you know, kind of maybe nudge PRX and say, check this person out. And then I read the job description. I just had this kind of sinking and rising feeling at the same time, which (laughs) was, um, you know, pure selfishness. Like, I don't want anyone else to have that job. (laughs) That's, I want that job. And it was, it was, uh, kind of surprising to feel that so strongly and know that it was really a great fit for me because I was quite happy at the ABC. I mean, the first year was really hard there, but we had sort of figured some stuff out and we really loved living in Australia. But um, ultimately I realized being involved with a smaller independent company supporting independent producers was a little bit more of a better match for me than working at a big state-sponsored enormous organization that was you know, constantly having to butt up against bureaucracy and paperwork and um, all kinds of protocol that really slowed us down and kind of hampered our efforts a bit. Hey folks, pardon the interruption just for a moment. I'd like to take a quick moment and tell you about this week's show sponsor. It's Podbean. Podbean is podcast hosting and monetization that you need to know about if you're already a podcaster or you are sitting here listening to this conversation and thinking, I would love to start a podcast myself. I'll ask you to consider Podbean. Podbean has all kinds of great features to help get you on the right foot. It, of course, has got your RSS and iTunes support. You can import and redirect Uh, It's got that support if you've already got a show to migrate everything over. You're going to get awesome mobile applications for both the major platforms, Android and iOS. You're going to see comprehensive podcast stats. I am long renowned as a stats junkie, and I can tell you having those comprehensive stats is a big deal. Uh, You're going to get a website as well. It's blog-like. It's got customizable themes and colors you're going to be able to share. Uh, You automatically uh, embed uh, a player that is awesome. Uh, or you can easily integrate it into your own website as well. It will do all of that and more, including an online directory and all kinds of promotional opportunities. It's also got integrated monetization tools. You can have your content be marked as premium. Uh, it's got a patron program. Um, and uh, you can also take advantage of their advertising platform. Uh, there are so many different offers and features uh, if you consider Podbean for your startup, uh, for your new podcast, or move your existing one over. And better yet, if you go to podbean.com backslash TPD for the Podcast Digest, TPD, podbean.com slash TPD, you're going to get your first month for free. It's a great deal. It's a great service. Check it out, folks. 
Now, let's get back to the conversation with Julie Shapiro. So it was the role of executive producer that brought you into Radiotopia. For folks who may not be familiar with what your day-to-day looks like or what sort of your uh, regular weekly, monthly goals are, sort of what does your uh, day entail? Well, uh, it's interesting because it has evolved a bit since I got here. I don't think anyone quite knew what the EP would be for because it was a new position. Um, And things have changed so much just in the two and a half years since Radiotopia launched. Um, But on a day-to-day basis, I'd say I'm mostly kind of both monitoring what's happening internally with our now 15 shows. So I listen to all the shows. I give some feedback if producers ask for it. Um, I am making sure of some housekeeping things like certain sponsors are thanked. And, you know, there's a lot of going into the business of what um, Radiotopia does for producers that I'm keeping an ear and an eye on. And and I should say the easiest way to think about what we do is that we, uh, you know, we're a curated network of what we say, um, you know, exemplary cutting edge podcasts. And we help producers do their best work while they're growing their audience and raising more revenue. So they can do their best work, so they can grow their audience, so they can raise more revenue, etc. Um, and we do this also by com- sort of uh, fostering a community between the producers, but also with our listeners. So I really feel like the EP position is this internal external split where part of my time is about having re- developing relationships and helping the producers with their shows. And the other part is keeping an eye and an ear on what's happening outside of Radiotopia with the other networks, with all the podcast newsletters, you know, with all the news about the industry, trying to get my brain around the metrics and the technology and the business side of things, which was never my strong suit coming in. I've always been a very content driven person, a curator, listener, appreciator. So I get to do all of that, but I'm also now privy to the nitty gritty of the metrics and the numbers and the competition and the sponsorships and that side of things. So it's, uh, yeah, it's both very focused inwardly on the network and also outwardly on what's happening around us. Does it feel as dynamic to be in the middle of all this as it appears from the outside? Because it seems like all those topics you just mentioned are constantly growing and changing and evolving from, you know, the content and the show editions that Radiotopia has had over the years, as well as a lot of what's happening in the market with advertising and listening metrics. It seems like there's no no constant but change. (laughs) Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yes. Um, and, it, you know, I think one of my one of the problems was I was trying to keep up with everything from Australia. So, you know, time difference aside, there was just so much happening that on, on top of my job, which was, you know, a 60 hour a week job, I was trying to understand what was going on here. Um, it is just manic. I find it totally hard, very hard to keep up with. And what I find is really missing in a lot of the conversations is content talking about the content. Um, You know, I don't know how much people who have these conversations about the business actually listen to very much. So I feel like uh, one thing we can do is really keep the torch burning for the content and talk about um, what makes these podcasts successful. Radiotopia is found in a very story-driven mode. And as the things change, as the environment changes around us, we may evolve to answer to that. But I think, you know, for us, it's keeping a sense of what makes a Radiotopia show a Radiotopia show is what's at the heart of every decision we make about adding shows or the the things we're going for in terms of extra projects or things outside of the shows, going on uh, live events, taking the shows out on the road, bringing people together. You know, we're we're focusing on what we do and what we need to continue to do to keep up with what's going on around us. Well, let's talk about the content, Julie. Uh, 15 shows currently inside of Radiotopia, but there weren't always that many. When you joined, uh, how many were in the stable at that point? There were 13 when I joined, um, and we brought on Millennial first thing. Well, not first thing, but pretty early this year. I guess May, halfway through the year. (laughs) And then we just announced uh, West Wing Weekly a couple weeks ago, so that was a pretty brand new addition. Uh, When Radiotopia launched, there were seven shows. And then the next year they added four and then there were two and then we added the one and then the one. And, you know, we have a PodQuest winner coming up, which will be announced in about a month. So, you know, the the network is going to continue to grow slowly through the end of the year. So since you came on board and, and maybe even prior to, if you can sort of speak to the methodology or the mentality, what are some of the things that, that Radiotopia traditionally looks for when deciding to add a show to a part of the network? Well, I can't speak to that 
first decision to bring those seven on board, um, you know, it was 99% Visible, which was Roman Mars's podcast, and he partnered with PRX to start Radiotopia. And I think a lot of those first decisions had to do with relationships that Roman had with some of the producers, people that we knew who were doing independent work on their own outside of the radio system, and some within the radio system, some of the founding members of Radiotopia um, are very, very deeply entrenched in the public radio system still, including Radio Diaries, which has right now, they have an amazing series going yes. out on All Things Considered, um, where they're revisiting uh, interviews that Studs Terkel did with workers back in the day. And they have access to some of that interview tape and they're finding the people and getting a contemporary sense, uh, contemporary take on their interviews from back when they talked to Studs. So there's Radio Diaries and the Kitchen Sisters who are like, you know, NPR uh, just luminaries, really. Yes. And then there was 99PI and Love and Radio and Theory of Everything and The Truth, which was one of like the first podcasts to do radio fiction and in, in a very contemporary way and make drama that was more like cinematic offerings for the ear. And there's always one that I forget. This is torture to try to name them all. Um, <laughs> I'm looking at the website. I'm trying to figure out. Love and Radio? Right. Is Love and Radio original? No, I said, lo- let's see. 99PI... Fugitive Waves, which is the Kitchen Sisters Radio Diaries, Theory of Everything. Oh, Strangers, Love and Radio, and The Truth. Yeah. So those were the first seven. And then the next year, they did a, an amazing fundraiser and were able to bring on four more shows and very purposefully tried to bring more women into the network with that. Right. So that was when The Illusionist joined with Helen Saltzman, brand new show that she made. Um, Roman knew her from another show that she had done with her brother for about 10 years called Answer Me This. Um, but it, it, at the time, it didn't quite seem like the right format for Radiotopia. And Helen's a total word lover and word person. So she developed this show, The Illusionist, which is all about language and semantics. And, you know, it's um, it's a kind of delightful spin through Helen's take on, on turns of phrases and the history of words and things. So she developed that brand new criminal um, was pre, was already existing and already on its way to being one of the best podcasts out there. Uh, Lauren Spore and, and Phoebe Judge down in Durham, North Carolina, Working on that, um, the heart was something that was already existing that we were able to bring in and, and help support to reach new audiences. And that was Caitlin Preston, Mitra Kaboli, and they were telling stories, you know, quite, uh, quite basically sexy stories about intimacy Mature, and human like, relationships. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but really smart too. I mean, it's never for the sake of that. You know, they are right. always, and and they are some of the most uh, talented sound designers out there. So. They really pay attention to how sound helps tell the story. Um, so there were those three, and Mortified was one that came on at, at the time, too. And that was something a little outside the usual Radiotopia show in that it was uh, more uh, recordings of live events of people reading their journals from when they were teenagers, but uh, also very story-driven. And the guys who produced that started figuring out ways to make it more than just a recording of a live show. So that was like the next class that came on. And then later that year, two more uh, podcasts that I think Roman just had always loved and really felt like they fit the Radiotopia model. That was the Memory Palace and Song Exploder. Yes. That, that, and that brought us up to 13. That's a heck of a, an addition. I mean, <laughs> it's, a, it's, it, it's almost like, uh, what, what can I uh, draw a parallel to? It, it's almost like Pixar at the point. It's like each new one that rolls out is just hit after hit after hit, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, because each and every one of those ones that we just went through is 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 amazing in its own way and unique in its own way. And I think that's one of the most interesting things. When, when you guys are looking at it, or do you look at it almost as a portfolio in the sense that you may not want to have uh, you know, more than one show sort of tread the same path? Or is that not really a consideration? No, I think content-wise, absolutely. Uh, when I think of diversity, I think of voice and background. I also think of creative approach and topic. Um, so, we, you know, we wouldn't, be, we wouldn't bring on another design show, for instance, and we'd be very careful about bringing on something that seemed too close to anything that pre-exists. So, you know, when we did PodQuest earlier this year where we put out an open call for podcast ideas, we got plenty of great ideas, but, you know, a large number of them were too similar to shows already in the network. Right. Yeah. I, I thought that may be a concern or a consideration when, when making those decisions, which leads me to to the most recent addition because – and and. And I want to you know, take this in the, in the most kind of spirit because it is. It seems very different than other shows with West Wing Weekly. Yeah, well, it's not, you know, a highly produced story driven show with a ton of sound design. There you go. Right? That's, right, <laughs> that's what right. I'm thinking. That um, is not one of those. Right. So what was the thought process? Uh, take us through that. 
Okay, well, I think that what I was talking about a little bit earlier where we have to start understanding how how Radiotopia can stay competitive and relevant in what's going on around us. So there are a few things about West Wing that make it fit like right in the Radiotopia wheelhouse for me. And that is one thing that is very consistent about who we're working with are is that we want to find the producers that are trying, that are the most motivated to do the best work and care about their independence. They own all of the creative content. We own none of it. Um, we have a very uh, wonderful relationship with Rishi, Rishikesh Herway through Song Exploder. And so we wanted to support this other project that he's been doing with uh, Joshua Molina, which is going through the West Wing episodes one week, one at a time, one per week on a podcast called the West Wing Weekly. Um, so where it isn't, you know, where they're not creating new story driven content, it's a relevant show talking about an, one of the most important TV narratives, you know, of the of ever really, um, and so it, their their motivation and their ambition with it put it right in the space that we want to be working in, and we also have to be realistic about what kind of shows we bring on. So we need the weekly big shows to balance some of the smaller ones that come out less frequently, so we can be supporting all of those shows because so, it's a collective effort um, with fundraising. It's a collective effort when we go after grants. So we, this is a, a way to kind of balance the offerings, balance that portfolio a little bit, um, support a producer we're already working with, bring on, you know, a really talented new talent into the network and, you know, play a little bit in the space, extend ourselves a little bit and try some new things and not get too stuck in one way of thinking about what Radiotopia can be. I think it's spectacular. I myself am not a West Wing fan, but just being present on social media, I have seen that show talked about so much. And it's been so, um, it, it appears to be so, um, you know, heralded as, you know, a spectacular listen. Um, and I see, you know, Aaron Sorkin recently made an appearance on it. So uh, obviously it's doing well. Uh, with that type of thing. So I, I love the idea of sort of Radiotopia kind of looking at that larger pie and saying, oh, no, we're, we're going to cut just a little bit bigger piece of this here. We want a little bit of this side, too. And I think that's great. I, I think it's wonderful that that you guys are willing to do that. Well, I'll say two quick things on that. One is um, here's my full confession. I had not watched West Wing yet. So and it always kind of meant to, but it felt too daunting to take it all on, you know, now that I watch TV a lot more often. Uh, now that I have a kid and, you know, we, we uh, get into the best TV. So I've always wanted to go back to West Wing. And now I, I, I think it's like the perfect homework assignment. So I've been starting and going, watching and then hearing an episode. And it's been so fun. So the best thing about not watching West Wing was that now I get to watch it and listen to the podcast and feel like I'm working at the same time. Um, and it's just a, it's such a, like a, an excellently formed idea. It's finite, you know. It's for anybody who's at all interested. It's it's a very rich experience to hear them talking about it. So, yeah, I do I do feel like um, it, it fits in perfectly with what we're doing. And um, yeah, I think it's important that we continue to surprise people and hopefully delight them, and you know, challenge ourselves to think about what we're doing in new ways. To me, Radiotopia is a very living organism. It can't stay in the same place. It must grow. Um, I mean, it's hard because we're a close-knit family, and the bigger it gets, the harder it will be to retain that kind of familial connection. But it's we're all very invested in that, and the producers who are involved really value that connection. That's kind of why they, they're with us. Everyone believes that we're stronger together. So I think as we grow and as we evolve in the format and what we can continue to bring into the network is just going to be what doesn't change is that sense of connection and that sense that we're all in it together and that we're there to support the producers in doing their best work. Can you break down for us what this idea of togetherness and support looks like? I believe most of you are in different locations across the country, right? Uh, oh, yeah. Majority. So, and England, too. Helen's over in London. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. yeah. So what does this look like? Are these sort of weekly Skype calls? Are there just sort of regular touch bases? Tell folks how this togetherness works. Yeah, it's challenging because as much as I want to bring people together regularly, um, the the thing I hear producers struggling with the most is, you know, their workflow and having time to, to put out their shows. And nowadays, putting out a show also means being a social channel, you know, right. master and being available for uh, Facebook Live sessions and being available for interviews and maybe taking your show on tour and engaging with your audience at every turn. So it's so, so, so much work and so time consuming that... Um, my challenge is to help the solidarity 
kind of live on but not make it oppressive and not make too much of a demand on the producers. So we have a Slack channel that's pretty active that all the producers uh, feed into where we share articles when they're about each other. People ask each other's questions. I know that there are a lot of personal connections between the shows and they'll reach out to each other if they have specific questions about things. We just brought everyone to Cambridge, um, well, to Alston, Boston, uh, for uh, a meeting, our annual meeting where all the producers came except for one who was overseas at the time. And then we had a big public party where we invited uh, people to come meet meet the Radiotopia producers. So we do that at least once a year. I mean, at this point, it's quite expensive to get everyone in the same place right. and to ask them all to take off time from producing their shows to come do this. But, um, you know, they're all getting to know each other better. Uh, we are doing monthly kind of social calls. And then every other month we'll be doing Radiotopia business video calls uh, there's a biweekly email that goes out with updates and links to um, things about the network and about the individual shows. So trying to be as consistent about that, but have a light touch so it doesn't seem like, you know, um, you want all of the benefits of being part of Radiotopia, but you don't want it to spill over into too much responsibility right. that gets in the way of you actually um, you know, making your show. And is that uh, another one that falls on your duty list, if you will, is that you often generating uh, the consistency of communication with this? Yeah, I'm trying to do the regular, you know, call outs and I'm available to all the producers all the time. So I have a lot of one on one conversations. Occasionally, a few shows at once will have a conversation about something. And then, you know, there's as much all a lot of optional. Basically, we'll start conversations that anyone can if they care to weigh in on. Um, you know, but between the time zones, it's very hard to get everyone on the same place, whether it's in a room or on a video conference call. I can imagine. I can imagine. A, a few questions on the business side of things, just curiosity and also your opinion, sort of. The, the first one's a curiosity. I've noticed as a regular listener to, I believe, 80 or 90 percent of the shows in Radiotopia, I've noticed a change lately. And I was just curious because I'm a junkie about these type of things, sort of what the boardroom, backroom thought process was. A few months back, you would hear randomly at the end of the show and closing credits, a particular show talk about another show, and it could be any of them. But now it seems to have shifted like you guys almost have a feature show of the month or something like that. Am I crazy or has there been sort of a, a new approach to that? Ding, ding, ding. No, no, you're totally <laughs> right. This was something that um, when I came on board was talked about a lot, the cross promo conundrum, mm -hmm. how to make the most out of that very valuable real estate at the end of the shows. Um, because, you know, there's a lot of at least speculation that podcasters recommending other podcasts is one of the best ways to get to grow your audience. Um, so we were always trying to leverage the sense of the network to uh, talk about each other's shows and promote them. But there wasn't you know, it was kind of an optional thing and you could pick one this week or that week. Um, I'm not exactly sure how it functioned before I came on board. But one thing I realized was, you know, to show the public, to show listeners like you who hear multiple Radiotopia shows across a couple of weeks, um, to sort of give a sense, infuse the whole network with the sense of that connection to each other. I thought if we all focused on one show at a time, that would be a great kind of signal outwardly and, and quite effective. And we have anecdotally seen numbers really go up when each show is featured. So presently, we try to keep the features contained into two weeks. So yeah. any show that go, is dropped within a two-week period, we'll talk about the same show at the end of that. Um, now with, I don't want to get too technical, but now that there's an ad technology that can feed ads back through entire catalogs, this also means that these cross promos are going out to many, many more episodes than just current episodes that are, that are um, being you know, come, that are published during that time. It's funny that you say that, Julie, because that's exactly what I was wanted to ask you about next. Hmm. Thine Erno again, insertion? Yes. Ernon <laughs> Lopez from Wondery was my guest about three or four weeks ago, uh, and he talked about his shows using the Art19 platform and the dynamic ad insertion and talked about inserting ads into fullback catalogs that would be more relevant to a listener. Uh, is that something or something similar that Radiotopia is now doing? Yeah, we have developed our own technology called Dovetail, actually, to service the Radiotopia and PRX shows. Um, and so it does exactly that. It can replace all, you know, we had the producers, the producers, about half the shows are now in the system, and they've all scrubbed their old episodes to take out anything that's time-based. Um, you know, it's also a problem if they say, 
we're running a Kickstarter right now. Go to the go get, <laughs> radiotopia.fm right. slash Kickstarter and donate. And it's two years later and that's not happening anymore. Right. Especially if we're running a new fundraiser, which I would be remiss to not say we are about to do. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. So cleaning up the back catalog to so we can inject or insert or stitch on the more relevant c- current ads. Also, you know, opens up the inventory so the producers can make a lot more money on, the, on those back um, episodes. So broad point of view perspective here and and I'm really interested in your take because you mentioned sort of when you first started into this or or that your uh, prior experience was more from a curator and a listener standpoint should a listener a podcast listener have any concerns about the concept of dynamic ad insertion or using things like I'm not sure how far dovetail goes I know art 19's taking into some of the components of even location or even going down to specific days and so on and so forth but are there any concerns you feel that that a listener, because listeners, some listeners I've talked to are worried, right? It's going to turn into radio. It's going to turn into cable TV, what have you. Can you assuage any of those fears? Well, I think, you know, I, um, I, I sympathize with some of that and might have at one point felt that way. But I think anyone who takes two seconds to think about how these shows get made for free that you get to listen to, you understand the necessity of uh, playing in that space and doing, you know, what what we try to do is be as creative with the ads and have the the ads be as native and uh, native sounding to the shows as possible. And I think there's a line you can cross with that too. I mean, I'm personally getting to the point where sometimes a very straightforward ad read is the most effective thing for my own interpretation of what of what's being sponsored. But you know, it's a very subjective uh, experience to listen to the ads. I think in some ways the technology can really serve the listeners in new ways like we can now like criminal can now put a an ad about their tour on all of their back episodes so if you're a a really big criminal fan you don't have to hear the first the current episode to know where they're coming but you could be listening and we can geo target so we can say coming to portland oregon on these days so i mean there's there's an infinite infinite possibility for ways the technology will enhance a listener's experience um could it get creepy and will it become Big Brother and are they going to, you know, become unlistenable? I, I think like there's no way to say no, but at least on Radiotopia, we're surely going to guard against that. <laughs> uh, we, you know, we totally have the listener's right. experience in mind, but we also have the producer's livelihood in mind. And therein lies the kind of the, the tension sometimes. Are there any other monetization conversations happening out there that that you find interesting? Obviously, there's membership, there's pledge drives, there's uh, Patreon. We all know about it. And now we're talking about advertising. So is there anything untapped or do you think we're going to kind of be dealing with these tools as an industry moving forward? Uh, I'm probably not the... Um the expert on this in the room, even though I'm sitting in an empty studio. Why don't you ask this plant? Um, no, I, I, I feel like I'm constantly catching up with what's going on because, as I said, this isn't my background. I mean, I definitely have a, a better handle on it. Um, I think, you know, the, the there's a constant desire to know what is going to happen next. And I think, you know, maybe ads will, uh, relationships with corporations will move into broader ones that aren't ad-based but are brand-based and affiliation-based. Um you know, everyone hopes to like get the ear of, of a kind of wealthy benefactor that can cut, scoop in and save the day. But that's not as realistic as thinking like, you know, the, the ads and podcasting business is becoming, you know, it's growing up, it's maturing, it's getting more sophisticated. And I think our best bet is to, to stay right on top of that and at the forefront of that, whatever movement that's going in and to be open to other ways as well and seeing where the advantages of the technology can dovetail with a more ah, dovetail. <laughs> unintended <Nice>. um, with <laughs> with uh, you know to, to get a sense for how the um the landscape is shifting and try to try to stay with that and not be afraid of it and not you know not be suspicious of it but embrace that and figure out like w- how can we pursue some of these relationships to to monetize things in different ways and i mean i think there's a lot of people thinking about this and and trying things out and experimenting and that's probably you know, as, as it'll catch on in different ways where you see more adventurous um, sponsorship plans and, you know, the live event strategy is starting to blow up a bit and you've got the native advertising on the side. So, I mean, there are all these other ways networks and companies are dealing with this. Um, what's best for Radiotopia? We think about that all the time. And I think our decisions are just constantly shifting and evolving and, and trying to keep up and, st- and stay stay ahead of it a bit. 
Well, let's uh, kind of bring the two topics together with the last thing you just mentioned there, because I, I did want to ask about the live events. And you mentioned Criminal is on tour now, which I think is awesome. Uh, Criminal is uh, one of my favorite shows, period, Radiotopia or otherwise. Um, and obviously you mentioned Mortified is sort of all bred from live events um, in terms of that. Are there thoughts with any other shows? You don't need to give anything away, but is it conversations that you guys are having about could some of these others potentially go that route as well? Yeah, definitely. Well, we're thinking about it from a, a bigger kind of network-wide perspective. We did this live show in L.A. last May, and it was a really special evening. Uh, we had, I think, nine of the shows participating and it was, it was this amazing um big theater the ace the theater at the ace hotel which has been a very historically important theater in la and it was a beautiful evening it really gave us the sense that the listeners came out in droves they loved the shows the sponsors were impressed the producers had a great time so we're trying we're thinking about our strategy for next year trying to do a little bit more network touring uh, maybe not all of those shows it was quite a production but you know grouping the coast, uh, maybe the shows on the West Coast, the shows on the East Coast, right. and doing some tours, um, going out for a few dates at a time because that was a one-off as well. So, I mean, the, the individual shows find their own way. Uh, for instance, the Hart and Benjamin Walker from Theory of Everything were just this week in Amsterdam at a conference doing doing shows, doing live perform, or at least the Hart did a live performance. So, I think the shows all do their own thing, and then what we can do is help promote those one-offs. Uh, Song Exploder does events, Memory Palace, Nate does a lot of events, and uh, even Roman takes the show out every once in a while and, and does a live event. So they're sort of doing it on their own, and we help where we can. We're trying to get a little bit more organized about that, and then also present some network-wide live opportunities for people for next year. Well, that's that's super interesting. I, I've yet to make it to any quote unquote podcast live event, but I would mm. love to because I can't imagine what some of these things uh, must be like to experience in, in person. Uh, some of these stories and, and some of these productions, especially when you're talking about some of the shows on the network that have, you know, the richer sound production, especially if that is intertwined into a live performance, it, it must be spectacular. Yeah, it's really uh, it's really a different thing than watching an interview take place in front of you, which can also be quite powerful and evocative and, you know, thrilling, depending on who's talking. Um, but when you see the, the story-driven shows do this, they are actual performances. They're not pressing play and listening to recordings. You know, they're they're interacting with tape and they're showing in visual enhancements to what's happening. Um, and there's a choreography and all these things. So it's, it's really a lot of fun. Plus, of course, you get to know the hosts a little bit better like phoebe and lauren are just so funny like to watch yes. perform I, I i highly recommend getting out to one of their shows because they're just they're top-notch performers and also very funny excellent excellent and i'm going to include all the links to to uh, i'll include links on the transom article we talked about the criminal tour all of that uh will be in the show notes folks as well so uh julie shapiro i want to thank you very much for taking the time to join me Oh, it's been really fun. Thanks for having me. Can you tell people where they can find all this great stuff we've been talking about? Ooh, radiotopia.fm is uh, a place where you can find a link to all the different shows. Of course, I, I recommend you also deep diving into each show because their websites all have a lot more information about what's going on with them. Um, we are revamping the website, so we plan to have a new site by December. And I will just drop the hint that there are some big surprises coming up for Radiotopia so keep an ear out. Um, you can find us on Twitter at Radiotopia, and there's a Facebook page, of course. So uh, yeah, we're, we're there's a lot going on here. And um, the, when I said manic earlier, it's manic out there. It's also pretty manic and busy in, internally. So lots of exciting stuff coming up. Awesome. And 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 again, the fun the fundraiser, our fall campaign is starting uh, in a few weeks. So keep an ear out for that as well. Absolutely. And folks, I hope that. I imagine many of you listening are subscribed to any number of these shows. Hopefully you found out about maybe a couple more you want to check out. And hopefully uh, we've shed some light on the inner workings of uh, your favorite network and mine, uh, Radiotopia. It has uh, uh, been great to talk to you, Julie. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Take care. And folks, that'll do it for my conversation with Julie Shapiro, executive producer at Radiotopia. What'd you guys think? Really interesting stuff from Julie. Uh, and the work they're doing over there at Radiotopia is second to none. Literally, I said in the conversation, one of my favorite networks, and I make no qualms about that. So many quality things. You could literally go show to show to show. Uh, and it makes me want to start checking out West Wing Weekly as well. Uh, like I mentioned to Julie, I wasn't necessarily a fan of the show, but 
maybe it's worth checking out. Uh, so all kinds of great stuff there. I hope you guys enjoyed. And again, if you did, take a minute, tell a friend, tweet this show out to people, or best yet, uh, consider leaving an iTunes review or uh, joining on Patreon to take the show uh, even further uh, than you wonderful folks already have. Uh, before I go, just want to remind you guys, you can get that first month free over at Podbean. If you're thinking of starting a podcast or looking for a great home for yours, you'll get one month free if you sign up with podbean.com slash tpd for the podcast digest tpd go over check out that site sign up you'll get your first month free to try all of podbean's great hosting features that's it episode 111 in the can folks hope you enjoyed my name is dan lizette for the podcast digest and i'll talk to you next week thank you for listening to the podcast digest you can follow the show on Twitter at Pod Digest. Like the show on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash the podcast digest. Email the show feedback at the podcast digest at gmail.com. And you can find all the previous episodes and exclusive blog entries at the show's website, thepodcastdigest.info. Don't, 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 don't,